Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 26. Again, that scripture reading will come from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 26. Where the Bible says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Then the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. What a delight it always is to be able to assemble with those of like precious faith and to spend this time together and worship to God and to blend our voices together and to know we have our Father's attentive ear when we approach Him in prayer and to have the occasion to remember and be humbled by the recognition of the depth of His love and sending His Son to die for us that we could remember as we take of those memorial emblems, that his body was broken, that we might have a resurrected eternal body in the after while. And that his blood was shed, that our sins might be removed and we could be reconciled to our Father. What a privilege. And then to be able to give back to him from a bountiful blessings he had bestowed upon us. Truly a privilege to be able to do that every first day of the week, particularly a privilege to be able to do it with you as we'll assemble here together as God's people. Glad to have those visiting with us. You're always our honored guest. And stick around a few moments after service and give us an opportunity to meet you and to make you feel welcome. As was mentioned in the scripture reading in this chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul had reminded the Corinthians, uh, Corinthians of the gospel. Those first four verses he told them it was the gospel that they had heard, the gospel they received, the gospel wherein they stood, and by which they were saved, if, this is a big if, if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you. Because he mentioned to them, had they not kept those things in memory, if they not allowed that to motivate them to live according to the principle of that gospel, then he would have preached to them in vain. And he specifically connected that to the resurrection of Christ. You see, the gospel is good news. And it's only good news if Christ is raised. And verse 19 says that if in this world only we have hope, we are above all men most miserable. And boy, the longer we live on this earth, the, the more we can understand that, can't we? If this is it, if this is all we have, we are above all men most miserable. But this is not all we have. This is not all we've been promised. This is not all we have looked forward to. But in the midst of that, as the scripture reading pointed out, he narrows their focus to the fact that the end is coming. Then cometh the end. That's pretty ominous, isn't it? Then cometh the end. Now this earth will stand until God's day comes when He speaks it out of being. But there's coming a time when it's going to end. And so I have to, and you need to, live with the end in mind. The end is going to come. Now we shouldn't just live in dread of that and under this dark cloud and the end's coming. The end's coming. But we need to live with consciousness that the end is coming. Now this chapter is saying the end is coming for those who are in Christ Jesus, those who understand and believe and have submitted to the principles of that gospel, the resurrection of Christ is what it's all about. And there's excitement about His coming. The end is coming. But He describes those things in reference to the gospel and the resurrection, and He said, Then cometh the end. You see, in reference to the end of time, the end of history, you know, some of us get all caught up in time, don't we? Have all kinds of calendars, we have all kinds of anticipations, we plan all kinds of trips, 
We have all kinds of anticipation to retirement. We are locked to our calendars and time. When the end comes, that's the end of time. No need for a calendar. No vacations will take place after that. No retirement's going to be enjoyed. All that you laid up for, not going to count. History, I'm a history buff. History's not going to matter anymore. History's going to be over when the end comes. And so I can learn from history, and Paul pointed out to us in our Bible class this morning that these things are written aforetime are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. But when you learn from those things, there were periods of time when the end came. Their end came. When God had been patient with them, when God had encouraged them, when God had, had pled with them, and then He said, your time is up. The end came. We could think about that in the days of Noah, could we? When he had Noah preach 120 years, and then come at the end. That was it. The time was up. No more preaching. No more time. He opened up the windows of heaven. He burst forth the, the fountains of the deep, and the earth was flooded. And all those who didn't live with the end in mind were swept away in the flood. There were periods of time in Israel's history when he said, you repent or you're going into captivity. And they didn't repent and they didn't repent. And finally he said, okay, it doesn't even matter now whether you repent or not, you're going into captivity. And they had false prophets said, no, no, you're really not going. And boy, when these nations started forming and Babylon got powerful and other nations fell before Babylon, they said, well, we might go. But we're not going to stay there very long. And before long... The end had come. And they were led away in captivity. It got brutal toward the end. People got their eyes gouged out. But not until they witnessed the horror of seeing their children murdered. And then their eyes were gouged out. And then they were led into that captivity. The end came. And that's not just to scare us. It's to say God has set time in motion. And He has set His time of ending this earth, and we need to realize it'll come. There'll be a time when the end has arrived. As Jesus says, here's what the gospel teaches. Here's your time of preparation. And that becomes significantly important as we contemplate those things. We understand that according to the second letter that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, well, he quotes from a passage of Isaiah, and he said, For he saith, I have heard there is a time accepted. In the time of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, behold, today is the day of salvation. Why? Why should that be important? Why should that terminology ring a bell with us? Because then cometh the end. You've got time now. I've got time now, but I need to live with the end in mind. There will come a time when I will not have time. Again, I don't live in dread of that, but I live conscious of that every single day. I'm conscious of it. The end will come. And I want to make sure that I live my day in such a way that, that if it were that last day, if that's when the end came, that I'm prepared. You see, God will abundantly bless and reward those who serve Him in this life. He wants to. He encourages us in every way to serve Him while we're here. But the coming end should move us, as He gets to the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15, should move us, Therefore, my beloved brethren, Therefore, my beloved brethren, knowing the end will come, knowing the resurrection has taken away the power of death, knowing that we have a, a, an anticipation that we can be resurrected with Christ and we can live with Him eternally, knowing that, therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always, always, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
Now, well, I, you know, I, I, if, I, if I could see signs, if, if there were a, a premonition, if I, I think this is probably as bad as it's going to get, and so the end may be near, then I'm going to straighten some things up. No, he said, you need to live your life abundantly all the time, always serving the Lord. Because you do know. Then cometh the end. That day's already set. The Father knows when that day is. The angels don't know that day. I don't know that day. They're not going to give you any signs of that day. He's going to come as a thief in the night that day. But that day is coming. And as a faithful Christian, I anticipate it. I want to fast forward all the way to the end of the Bible, all the way to the last chapter of the Bible, all the way to the last verse of the Bible, and be able to say, even so, come Lord Jesus. I know the end is coming. I know the end is already set. I know everything's going to be wiped away. But I also know that's when eternity starts. And that's when my aboding in the presence of God begins. That's when I can thank God in His presence forever and ever. And so I want to live my life, as Paul said, knowing that. Being conscious of His resurrection and also being conscious, then come at the end, live in a way, every day, that you're always abounding in the work of the Lord. When you get to that last book of the Bible, it talks about those works of the Lord, doesn't it? Because that voice comes from heaven and speaks to John and said, John said, I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Henceforth they shall rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Write that down. Tell them about it. Because the end's coming. So when you think about that end, the end will mean the end of Christ's reign. The text that Zach read for us said that. Then he's going to deliver the kingdom back up to the Father. Now Matthew chapter 28 said that Jesus was given all authority and all power in heaven and on earth. And those apostles were to go and preach the gospel or teach the gospel to all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and to teach them to observe all things whatsoever He commanded them. Because it was that Jesus who promised in Matthew chapter 16 and, and verse 16 that He was going to build His church. And He's going to give His uh, apostles the keys to His kingdom. So he's been given authority over that kingdom. And he's sending the message of the kingdom out for everybody to have an opportunity to enter the kingdom. And you and I can have the privilege of Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, of experiencing being translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. What a privilege. What a blessing. Now, if I've been translated out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son and the end comes, what do I have to fear? I'm in His kingdom. He's my king. But He's going to deliver it back to the Father. The Father had commissioned Him to take care of these matters. When these matters are taken care of, and He takes His people back to the Father, then He'll no longer be the head of the kingdom. He delivers it back to the Father. But you and I get to be privileged to be in that kingdom now. At 1 Corinthians 15 says that at the end, Jesus is going to surrender. Deliver all that back to the Father. I want to be part of that. When that kingdom is delivered back to the Father, I want to be a member of it. I want to be there when that takes place. Because the end is coming. I want to live with that in mind. With that end in mind. That that, that kingdom is going to be ushered there. And I can be part of that kingdom. Not in a, a dreadful way. But in a triumphant way. It will all be accomplished. That kingdom that I've been translated out of darkness. Won't be in the presence of God. Nobody who resides there. 
Nobody who's ruled over the princes of, by this, uh, princes of this world, they're not going to be there. When the end comes, there are no changing kingdoms. You're either going to be in His kingdom and deliver back to the Father, or you're going to be in eternal darkness. But when the end comes, it means that the end of death and the end of this present world will occur. Verse 54 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 underscores that for us. It makes sure that we don't forget that so when that corruptible has put on incorruption and that mortal has put on immortality, then he said, then it is brought to pass a saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now that's what I want to be a part of is, is the victory part. You remember a few Wednesday nights ago, the uh, Brother Jerry pointed out to us in our study of, of the devil, sin, and hell, that when you get to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we win. <laughs> the Lord's already won. His kingdom's already in power. And so when death is swallowed up in victory, that'll be the end of our existence here. It'll be the end of any kind of power death would have over us. And if that kingdom is described in that final place of residence is ours, all tears will be wiped away from our eyes. No suffering, no pain, and guess what? No death. So I want to live with that end in mind. That means I can live my life then on purpose, with purpose. That I want to be in Christ, I want to be in His kingdom when He delivers it back to the Father. I want to make sure that I'm a full beneficiary of the victorious nature of Christ's resurrection over death. And that I can share in that if I'm willing to be buried with Him in death. Romans chapter 6 verse 3 and 4 says, what? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we should walk in newness of life, that abundant life, that life filled with service to the Lord, that life filled with anticipation of the resurrection and the after while, and for us to triumphantly be taken back to the Father. Those who are not part of the kingdom... Those who die in darkness, that day is still coming. Then come at the end. We see just the opposite will be experienced by them. What a sad thought. There is a dark cloud over that, isn't it? Do you get to that day and you're not prepared for that occasion? Not a triumphant scene. That same last book of the Bible... Those same last two chapters says they'll experience the second death. Oh, what's the second death? We talked about that a whole quarter, didn't we? What's the second death? You see, physical death occurs when our spirit leaves our body. There's a separation of our spirit that was created in God's image and our bodies that will go back to the dust. A separation. That second death is going to be that permanent separation of us and our spirits from the presence of God eternally. That's the second death. There's no victory in that. Just defeat. See, God wanted us to be in His presence, to be reconciled to Him, to be there forever and ever. There's a place being prepared for us there. John chapter 14. All kinds of preparation being made. I have to live with the end in mind and saying, Am I so connected to this world, this present world, that when the end does come, I'll be ill prepared for that world? He's preparing for me. Am I preparing for him? Not in dread of that last day of, Oh, boy, you know, it's, it's kind of stormy out. What if this were the last day? Oh, if terrible things happen in my life, what if this were the last day? You see, I have to live all my life saying, look, 
I'm going to live as if it were my last day, and I want to abound in the work of the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 emphasizes to us, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. He says, Into which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the works and the things that are therein shall be burned up. Oh, but I got the prettiest 40 acres you've ever laid your eyes on. I mean, it's got a lake, and it's connected to a river and a forest, and they even got state-controlled property around it, and so nobody's going to ever get close to it. Burned up, gone, vanish. The end will come. Nothing at all enjoying that 40 acres. Enjoying God's creation and thanking God for it. Nothing at all, unless... Unless that keeps you from knowing, and then come at the end. This is just permanent. Use it up for the Lord. Have God's people out and enjoy His creation. Take young people on trips on that 40 acre. Do everything you could possibly do to glorify the Lord who's blessed you those 40 acres. While you have the 40 acres, for then come at the end. And what did you do with the 40 acres? See, it becomes significant, doesn't it? It becomes important. Not anything wrong with us having them, unless it takes something else away from us. And that's what he's saying to these Christians. You abound every day in the work of the Lord, and so that you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. But also, the end means the end of imitation. That last book of the Bible, that last chapter, it's almost as if the Lord said, sing one more stanza of that imitation song. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Whosoever will, let him come. He that is a thirst, let him come. And take of the water of life freely. What a beautiful invitation. But you see, when the end comes... There will be no more invitation. If you've ever been in a, a, a revival meeting, a gospel meeting, or maybe just the preacher fired up and, you know, he's preaching and said, okay. Stops the song leader and said, turns and faces all of us and says, we're going to sing one more stanza. Just one more. If you're here and there's something you need to correct in your life, now's the time to do it. What if this were the last stanza that you ever hear? That's what Revelation 24 says. Ask them one more time. Tell them how much heaven wants them to come. Extend that invitation one more time. But this passage said, then come at the end. We're not going to just protract it on out and on out and on out. The Lord set the time. For the end to come. There will be no more invitations sung. There will be no more opportunities. For us to get right with God. And to serve God faithfully. And our trust in God. Our faith in God. Our knowledge of God. Our service to God. Is all connected to the word of God. No other way to understand it. No other way to receive it. No other way to be obedient to it. Faith comes only one way. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. And that is by hearing God's word. And we better listen carefully. Paul built his whole premise in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection of Christ. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's what they'd heard. That's what they'd received. That's what they were living in. That's what they were going to be saved by. But it's all dependent upon the resurrection of Christ. That he would swallow up death. But he also said he's going to deliver the kingdom back to the Father. When? Then come at the end. It's going to come to the end. Who is he? John chapter 8 verse 24 said, If you believe not that I am he, you'll die in your sins. There is no other answer for our sins. It's Christ. The resurrected one. The one who not only removes our sins, but will 
usher us back up to the Father to deliver us safely home in that place He's preparing for us. Do you believe that this morning? If you do, then your lips would be the one to say, as the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Do you believe that? 1 Corinthians 15 is pleading with us to believe that. If we don't believe that, we only have this world and we are to, above all men most miserable. This is it. And boy, I'm old enough to say, boy, if this is it, my body's having problems and my eyesight's not so good and boy, if the people that I love die and the country's in a mess and oh, I began to look around and say, if this is it, I'm miserable. But then I look up and say, oh, this is not it. No, this is not it at all. Then come at the end, and no wonder, Paul said, this ought to motivate you. Knowing that, brethren, my beloved brethren, knowing that, be you steadfast. Don't let anybody move you away from your relationship with the Lord, because the end is coming. If you stay where you are, and you're faithful to the Lord, and you're abounding in the work of the Lord, you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord when the end comes you don't have to worry about that being the end because that's the beginning for you. You see, when that eunuch made that confession in Acts chapter 8, then they commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. They both came up out of the water. The Spirit caught away Philip and it said the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. If that day had been the end, rejoicing forever. Now, I don't have any other recordings of what happened to that eunuch when he got back down to Ethiopia. The Bible doesn't record that for us, but we know he had the opportunity to know the truth, don't we? We know that he obeyed the truth, don't we? We know that on that day he was prepared for the end, wasn't he? So what do we do from there? We do as Paul encouraged us to do. And we keep abounding in the work of the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2, it said, Seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets us. And let us run with patience. Let us run with patience. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Listen, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy set before Him, despised the same, endured the cross, and is set at the right hand of the Father on high. You know when He's going to leave the right hand of the Father? When He comes back for the kingdom. And when He receives the kingdom, He's going to deliver it back to the Father. And then cometh the end. If this were the end this morning, ready for the end? If you're a faithful child of God, you're excited about it. Even, come, even so, come Lord Jesus. If today were today, that'd be celebrated, a celebration for us. But if we're not ready, oh, we better get ready because the end is coming for sure. And he tells us the context of that and how to prepare for that. The question would be this morning, are you prepared? We've told you in the course of this lesson how to become a Christian. We've encouraged you in this lesson to be a faithful Christian. If you can take this opportunity now, prepare in whatever way you need to prepare, we stand ready to help and assist you as we stand and as we sing.